combination of both. And I think the combination Fulbright is the most common one that faculty get. Um, there's about 8,000 Fulbrights awarded every year, although in recent years, the State Department, which sponsors Fulbright, uh, saw some reduction in funding, although we're hoping that that will change in the future. So essentially, you have to have a reason to go to the place you're going to. And I probably was very naive when I applied for my first Fulbright 15 years ago. I had actually gone to Croatia because we had another faculty member, Dorothy McClellan, who was there on a Fulbright, and I visited it. And I met a lot of her colleagues. And as a result of that, was encouraged to apply myself. My original award ended up being at a medical school in uh, Zagreb, the capital of Croatia, because they were starting a new English language instruction program for medical students that had left Croatia, whose families had left Croatia during the war and uh, were coming back and had children who didn't speak Croatian. <laughs> so uh, my initial placement was at the medical school. And it was really interesting because they did not have licensure as we know it in the United States because they had been a socialist country for many, many years. And so they had never really seen a psychologist who practiced independently like I did. So there's, there's always an interesting exchange of knowledge that becomes part of the process. Um, I also ended up going to the university and teaching the first class on gender at the University of Zagreb, which was founded in the 1300s, I believe. <laughs> so that was really interesting, although I had to be monitored by a faculty proctor. <laughs> and we think doing our grades are hard in Croatia. When you take a class, first of all, you don't get to pick your major. Uh, you have to take all these tests when you try to get into college. And when you go into your major, you go immediately into your major. All the stuff that we think of as the core curriculum, they all do in high school. And so you get selected into your major. So it's a very different kind of educational setup than we're used to. And you take a class for a year, and then you have to qualify to take your exam by taking one exam. And then you have to take an oral examination in every class to get credit. <laughs> And if you fail it one year, you have two opportunities to take it the next year. And then when you're done, the faculty member signs this little book that looks like a passport, and that's how you get assigned your grade. So it's a very different process. Um, but the, the teaching and the scholarship part of it was only one part of it. The American Embassy in Croatia would, uh, sponsored a lot of activities where they invited the Fulbright scholars and the Fulbright students to participate. It was an election year when I was there. And so they would have little soirees at the ambassador's mansion where we would interact with Croatian uh, politicians and watch the televised debates and have commentary about them. So uh, you really are operating not just as an ambassador of your school, but also as an American ambassador in some ways. And I found the embassy to be you know, really extraordinarily helpful for us. They also gave us extra funding to travel and present at academic conferences and so on and so forth. So there's a lot more going on than just your simple teaching uh, duties. In addition, it really gives you the opportunity to embed in the culture. And I was very fortunate in that I rented a 700 year old apartment in the most historic part of Zagreb and my landlord lived in the attic and he was a five star chef and for $50 a week, he cooked dinner for me every night. <laughs> <laughs> he also shined my shoes and did my laundry, too. <laughs> That's a whole other story. Um, and, and so it's one of these interesting experiences that really depends a lot on what you make of it. And I was fortunate in that I was able to connect with, with individuals in the university and the uh, psychiatric community and it meant doing things that were not always easy. For instance, I gave lots of talks at professional organizations where I would have to have somebody translate and have somebody translate back to me at the same time. And that can be really extraordinarily exhausting, but it was really fun. I was there for a year. Um, I was offered an additional six months by the American embassy when I was there, but I, I turned it down because I felt I needed to uh, come back to the United States. 
And today I'm still in contact with and doing research with faculty members that I have met when I was over there. So I think that's one of the goals of Fulbright is to connect around something that's going to bear more fruit in the future. So that was my first experience for a year. My second one was as a Fulbright Senior Specialist, which is a designation that you can apply for with Fulbright. And you get designated as a specialist for five years and then countries can request you to participate in short programs for them. So there was actually no psychology specialty. So I convinced the Fulbright board that I was a public health specialist in mental health, which I am. And um, so I was able to get in under the public health specialization and I was requested multiple times. I was set to go back to Croatia as a specialist, but there was a, uh, the federal government shut down and there was no funding available, so I couldn't go. And then uh, was requested to go to Kazakhstan and was subsequently requested again, but was unable to go. And when I went to Kazakhstan, I was invited to teach at a clinical training school that was established by a woman who was a, a Kazakh psychologist who had only been trained in psychoanalytic psychotherapy. And if you're an American, you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> we don't do that anymore. And so that was an extraordinary experience. It was uh, the most uh, diverse culture I've ever been in. It was part Asian, part Russian, part European. Uh, and um, it was a lot more challenging to be there because uh, the language was surreal in Cyrillic. It was Russian, although people spoke Kazakh. And um, so that was a really exciting opportunity too. And I think in some disciplines, the specialist uh, designation is really a good way to go because there might be lots of areas in which you could be requested in. I've also served as a Fulbright reviewer on four different occasions and that's the review process it first involves a peer review then a second level of review and then finally a review either through the state department or at the country with the state department it depends on the country and so i've literally read hundreds of fulbright applications and have assisted lots of people usually when you come back they give your number to people and they'll call you and ask you for your advice and there's a couple of tips that I can give you about the process. First of all, you're much more likely to be able to get a Fulbright Award if you pick up uh, one of the non sort of traditional countries. Like it's very hard to get into France, let's say, or Great Britain. But if you wanna go to the Far East, it's much more accessible. And when I went to Croatia, it was only six years after uh, the war and a lot of people didn't want to go there. And now it's very hard to get, get into Croatia because it's become very popular. So looking for opportunities outside of maybe your traditional comfort zone is a good way to start. Second of all, you have to have a reason to go to that place. It can't just be because you want to see that place. They want to make sure that you're teaching you know, maybe you're adding something to their curriculum that they've never had before or some area that you're in is something that they want to develop or your research project specifically requires access to somebody in their country for a bona fide reason. And so I think that's the other uh, really essential key. And what helped me enormously was having a contact in the country. And a lot of the applications will say, you don't need a letter from the country. But trust me, if you have a letter from the country where somebody is endorsing the reason for your visit, it is a huge plus to the reviewers who are evaluating it. You also have to have a realistic timeline. You know, a lot of people come in with these outrageously complex projects that don't factor in the fact that you'll be living in a foreign country. You're going to have to put your kids in an American language school. Uh, Simple daily negotiations can be extraordinarily complex. I'm thinking about, uh, I was there during Thanksgiving and there were five American Fulbright students there and we decided to meet at one of their apartments and have Thanksgiving dinner. Well, I was the only one who knew how to cook, right? So I got tasked with the turkey. 
And my landlord, I said to him, I said, can you get a turkey for me? And he said, okay. And he goes to the market and Vlado looked like a sumo wrestler. Okay. So he was a great chef, but he looked like a sumo wrestler. I still remember him knocking on my door and he says, his problem. I was like, what? He could only get an 11 kilo turkey. <laughs> 11 kilo turkey is like this big. And he, he says, come see. And I go into his little kitchen, which is the size of a small bathroom stall. And he holds the thing up by its neck. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> I'd never had to cut a neck, uh, head off a turkey before. He trimmed it up. Croatian ovens were about this big. I cooked it at one of the students' apartments with a quarter of an inch. It took 11 hours to cook the turkey. Um, and... Uh, we had to transport it there on a tram and I was with one of the American students and she's holding the giant turkey and the blood is seeping out of the bag that the turkey's in and we're on the tram and I'm carrying a uh, attache case full of knives to trim the turkey with, hoping I don't get arrested by the tram police, which happened the second week I was there. But uh, so in order to be successful at this, you have to have a sense of humor and you have to have a flexibility. If you think you're going there to impose American values on your host country, it's it's not going to work. And and uh, so um, it stretched me in ways that I never imagined I could be stretched in. And I mean, I moved there having never seen the place I was going to live and having never met any of the people I was going to work with. And I had a fantastic experience. So. If you're open to new experiences, it is an incredible opportunity for you and for your family, I might add, too. Many of the scholars that came the second half of the year I was there brought their kids with them and thought it was amazing. So is that my time? Okay, good. Kevin? Um, hi, I'm Kevin Concannon. Uh, I, I just want to echo Pam's uh, words. I think my experience was very similar, uh, except I didn't have the five-star chef. Uh, my, experience, <laughs> my experience was, um, the benefit of my experience was we were able to find an apartment that actually had a washer and a dryer, which um, in Germany, getting a, a dryer is very difficult and a dishwasher. Uh, so I had a Fulbright in, in Potsdam, which is just outside of Berlin in Germany. And, and it was in the former East Germany. Uh, and like, like Pam, I was really naive. I was a, a, had just got my, my PhD. Uh, I didn't have a teaching job. Uh, and my advisor came to me and said, hey, how about a Fulbright? And I said, okay, uh, what is that? I mean, I didn't even know much about it. Uh, he had previously been on a Fulbright. And I think like Pam was alluding to, he had connections. And he said, you know, you should try this. And so I filled out an application and I was really fortunate to get a, a teaching Fulbright at the University of Potsdam, which was an American studies university. Uh, and I, as Pam has been talking about, I didn't know anything about Potsdam. I didn't know the place. I just showed up one day uh, and found an apartment and kind of moved forward. But it was a great experience. Um, I was I was I had to sort of rethink my teaching. I had no idea how teaching was was done in Germany. Um, I had a difficult time sort of adapting, obviously, to the language. I, I didn't know the language very well. Uh, so, I mean, my first day, the class was 45 students and I was prepared to discuss uh, the class, which was a class on American studies. And about five minutes in after I started asking questions, uh, the, one of the students raised their hand and said, we don't discuss in class, you just lecture. And I said, oh, well, that's that's going to be a problem because uh, I don't have an hour and a half of lecture prepared. So it it was it was a really it was very much a learning experience for me and being flexible and sort of changing my teaching and thinking about things differently, uh, because for, for me, teaching American studies in, in Germany, they there were many things that we take for granted that we know about in terms of American culture, which they didn't. Um, at the same time, they, they were very much an expert on memorizing facts about the United States. They knew who the undersecretary of defense was, for instance, which, you know, I wouldn't know. Uh, and at the same time, they're also very fascinated with the United States. Uh, mo much of the curriculum, students would travel 
uh, from the University of Potsdam to the United States and spend six months or so there. Uh, so they were very fascinated with American culture and, and, and the states. Uh, and it always surprised me because their biggest place they wanted to go to was South Dakota. Uh, and I was always curious, like, why South Dakota? Uh, and it was it was the place that, that was most similar to Berlin, they thought, because uh, it was cold. So they always wanted me to talk about South Dakota, which I had no idea anything about South Dakota. Uh, but that was a popular popular spot. Um, I don't think I have much to add to Pam's discussion. I think I think the keys are really being flexible, being able to adapt and to be open to different learning experiences. Uh, when I was there, I, I made use of a Fulbright opportunity to travel around Germany. Uh, you, were, you were asked sometimes to teach at different schools, and I made use of that to sort of create links um, to different schools. I returned to Germany about five years later, uh, even though it wasn't under Fulbright. I, I returned because I had made friends there and, and I continue to have uh, friends and, uh, and work with scholars in Germany. So it was a great opportunity to meet people um, and do research there. So, um, but I mean, I think that that's all I really have. I guess that makes me next. Am I live? Good. Um, I met a graduate student from Thailand and I helped him with his English. And because I like nice level relationships, I had him teach me some Thai as I was helping him with his English. So he taught me how to count and ask where the bathroom was. And I was in Montana and a woman from Thailand was coming through and I met her and I said, hello. I counted from one to 10 and I asked her where the bathroom was. And then I asked her if she had met the grad first graduate student who showed me this sheet of slides of a little pottery village. And I fell in love with the surfaces on these pots. And I asked her if she had met this village. And she said, what? Well, my tie was terrible. I had like a vocabulary of 30 words. And she said, what do you mean? I said, do you know where this is? And she said, oh, I own a pottery there. And I decided I had to go. And I immediately started working on the language, which proved to be really smart because I ended up having to call her and she lived in a little third world village with one phone. And I got the phone at her parents' house in the city and I had to talk to her mother and her mother only spoke Thai and we managed to communicate enough that I should uh, call back 24 hours later. So I ended up spending 10 months in a hut where uh, snakes would come through. I got bit by a rat one night. Uh, it was a very difficult year. Most of the real problems were social, but I had a lot of health problems too. And it was the most transformative experience of my life. It was like nothing else. And if you talk to anybody that knows me, if I don't mention Thailand every hour, it's an unusual day. Uh, I've got my little communication device here. I've got four ways to talk to my friends in Thailand, and I use them all, all the time. Fifteen years ago, I was here teaching, and I spoke more Thai that year than I spoke English, the year after the Southeast Asian tsunami. I have a uh, formula that I use for applying for grants now, and I don't apply for a lot of grants, and I'm not a medical researcher. I'm not a very good writer, but my writing is getting better. And what my formula is, is what do they want to fund that I want to do? What do they want to give me money for? That's what I want to find. I want them to give me money. Where do those two overlap? You can talk about the stuff that's on the outside of that overlap if you want, but it's a waste of words. What do they want to fund that you want to do? And then the clinchers, the two clinchers are, why is now the time to do this? And why am I the person? I have never failed to get at least close to the end result in a grant where I could do all of those things. And getting one of these things is a problem in ideation sometimes. So they produce a new, it used to be a booklet, a grants booklet would come out and you'd flip through the booklet for ideas. Now you gotta go to their website and if you want one of these things, I would suggest going to their website three times a year. Set yourself a calendar invite and go look at their website 
until you get an idea that you can do. Uh, and then you have to really think about the audience when you're writing this grant. And in my experience, I've got, I've got six applications into Fulbright. Five of them have made it through the peer review. Three have been funded. To me at this point, I'm thinking the peer review is the easy step. The hard step is the State Department and the foreign country. I don't know where they get hung up, but I've seen a lot of other ones go by. And you have to think about your audience. And you should read what they say, what they're trying to do with the grant and what the Fulbright's trying to do. And try and meet those needs in your proposal. Um, what else do I have to say about that? I, I can't tell you, I have no idea what my life would be like without it. I mean, everybody's worried about the pandemic. You're worried about getting sick. You're worried about that. There's only one thing I'm really worried about. I want to be able to go back to Thailand. I love being there. It is so, it is still such a new experience. And because I'm coming from another country and because I now speak Thai fluently, I get access to all sorts of things. The last grant that I had successful was from the government of the province that I live in there. And I was the, the, uh, the end of the grant proposal it was all verbal. And I told the governor why he wanted to fund 15 foreign artists to visit Thailand. And he said he'd give us $80,000. And I did that all in Thai and it was really, it, it feels really good. Unfortunately, that grant was supposed to start when classes end in December and last for a month. And that is toast. Um, what else do I have to say about Fulbright? I didn't have the thing where I had close contact with the Fulbright. They had a very hard time talking to me. In order to call me when I lived there, you had to call the village's phone. A guy got on a motorcycle, drove to our house, picked you up on the motorcycle, drove you four kilometers back to the phone. You had a phone call. And uh, it, it was such a novel thing. It's not like that anymore. But I can't tell you, you, you should try and do it. It is so transformative to live in a radically different culture for that long, it, you know, I, I moved here, I, I grew up in Michigan, and this is a different culture. And I think that Thailand trained me to see more of what was different and has made this place more interesting because of it. So I guess that's what I have to say. Who's next? I think I need the presenter ball, unless you want to, because uh, I share screen as an option. I am now a presenter. It's <laughs> All right. Well, I really, I really don't know what I can say um, beyond what great advice you've already been given. But maybe the way to think about what I'm going to talk about writing a successful Fulbright application is really how to take the advice that uh, each of our panelists have given you and wrap it up kind of neatly. Um, but first, a plug from our sponsor. Um, so I am uh, Colleen Fitzgerald. I'm in the I'm associate vice president in, in, for research and professor of English housed uh, working in the division of research and innovation and we. We are doing lots of stuff, especially um, of relevance to you from our research development office, where we work on internal funding to help faculty research scholarship and creative activity, foster those interdisciplinary research collaborations and increase submissions like the Fulbright application. So we have a, a research development officers on staff right now. We have 1. we're hiring a 2nd. The 1st 1 is Larissa, Dr. Larissa Ford. This is a resource you have to read your proposal, whether it's internal or external. Um, so really take advantage of us. We're here to support you. Your success is our success. So, um, again, kind of pulling it all together, showcase your strengths. You really want to be strategic in choosing the country. Um, as Professor Katz said, what is unique about you? 
How can you use that to tell a compelling story and hook the audience? And whenever you're thinking about an application um, for, for a grant or a fellowship, you really want to think, what's my hook? And what is the compelling story I can tell about me fitting into, whoops, sorry, fitting into um, the funder's goals? You're also going to want to be strategic in choosing your recommenders. So who, who gets you um, and they can and they get your strengths. So you'd really want to have your um, your recommender is helping to tell that compelling story about you and your project. You're only going to have a certain amount of details in your uh, application, but recommenders are another way to amplify and help make this uh, a compelling story, a compelling project that that makes the reviewers and ultimately Fulbright want to fund your pro your project this cycle. Preparation and more preparation. We uh, again, Professor Katz talking about do your homework, right? Read the Fulbright catalog, see what what postings are there. Um, and in you know Grant's world, we call that sort of the solicitation. Read the solicitation. Um, so you know, faculty are always talking about read the syllabus, right? It's all in the solicitation. Um, think about what the Fulbright's mission is and how will your project help them achieve their mission and goals. So it's really in a grant proposal, it's really never about you. Uh, it's really about you fitting them. And um, you know, if you're able to read successful Fulbright applications, I encourage you to get a hold of them, write them, and, and read them. Um, you know, part of successful grant writing is reading grants. Um, start early, write that first draft early, ask your recommenders early and give them a draft when you have it. So if your recommenders are able to see your application, then what they're going to be able to do is maximize and be strategic about what they put in, your, in their, that recommendation letter. Solicit feedback, right? We do, it, it really does take a village to put all these pieces together. Um, you're not in it alone, right? You have a panel today where people have come to share their feedback, give advice. So you, you've gotten that draft done early. Now you're gonna find people to read it. You're gonna give these people lots of time to read it. You really optimally do not want to hand some, you know, email something and say, hey, can you get me feedback tonight? Um, you know, you gotta be reasonable and give people uh, time to read it. You want to take their feedback into consideration. If people have um, you know, reviewed your proposal and given you comments, uh, there's a reason they've spent time on it. They're, they're invested in your project now as well. And if you, especially if you want to go back to them and get comments on a second draft, um, they're going to expect to see that you, you've, made, you've taken those comments into consideration. They're not making the same comments again. Um, and part of what I'm really advising you as well is revise, revise more, share the revision with other people, repeat, right? So the, you want to make sure that you're um, really putting something together that is a clean, easy to read, um, beautiful document that is readable, that's not got typos, that's not got grammatical issues, that's not got lost sentences or you know weird cut, cut and paste. Um, and then you want to think about your reader. You want to avoid jargon. You want to strive for clarity. Uh, be specific. We just did a research enhancement panel, and um, you know there were some cases where people didn't. The panel could not tell what the project was about. It was way too technical. So really think about how to uh, give your elevator speech. Um, you know what when you're talking about your project, how you're going to put it in its simplest terms, um, and really also be specific. What exactly do you plan to do? Um, as Dr. Briard mentioned, having a letter from your uh, host, um, you know, all these are resources that help you be specific. Don't make your reviewers work to figure out what you're planning to do. Um, reviewers don't want to get at the end and, and, then, and then be, oh, okay, that's what they're doing. Um, so you want to make it easy for them to get your hook. You want to make it easy for them to get pulled into your compelling story and root for you to get to go and do this project. You want to remember that your reviewers are reading lots of proposals and they're not specialists in your field. 
So I'm a linguist who works on Native American languages. Actually, I work on Udo Aztecan languages. Actually, I work on Udo Aztecan phonology. I cannot write a proposal. I cannot write a Fulbright application if I wanted to go work with a Udo Aztecan language community in Mexico. I can't write for that other person like me, right? I've got to write for a broader audience. Be patient and wait. Um, the bad side of grants, besides not getting them, is that they're out of your hands. But if you you put the work in, you do the revisions, you plan early, um, you marshal your resources, um, you really have uh, put you put your you know you put your best shot together, and that's really all you can ask to do. Thank you. It's a very lengthy process. Um, you apply a year in advance. I think the applications, they move, they fiddle with the dates this year, but I applied in August and I didn't get my final. Yes, you're going until May the following year. And, you know, the electronics are so much better now in terms of communication that I think it's easier. But uh, when I went, I had to be fingerprinted at the police station and send it to the FBI. And they sent it back to me the day before I left. I had to send my passport to L.A. to the Croatian consulate. They sent it back the day before I left. I got to Croatia and they decided since I was there on a new visa that I had to pay to have everything translated into Croatian. And we got in a big argument about that. And finally, that got smoothed over. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong. <laughs> um, but those are part of, uh, I think, what Lewis is alluding to. It's part of what is so fascinating about it because you come to understand yourself so much through your own cultural lens. And when you go to a foreign country, first of all, it's nice to work in a foreign country because that will get you in with people in a way that will never happen if you're just a tourist. But secondly, it's a little like walking through a fun house and looking in the funny mirrors because the reflection you see of yourself in terms of how they understand you and your culture feels so distorted to you but is absolutely real to them. And, um, and if you're able to approach that with some degree of sensitivity, it can be an extraordinary learning experience. Like, you know, I was over there during um, an election period when we were in Iraq. I mean, there were all kinds of political things happening um, that uh, people were sensitized to and and asked you for information. They, they'd say to me, is it really true all Americans have guns? 15 years ago, I, I said no. Today, I might answer that a little differently. But um, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see your culture reflected in how people perceive you, including your academic culture. I mean, even though virtually everyone I worked with at the university spoke English extraordinarily well, when we were talking about clinical psychology stuff and we we're kind of getting into fine grained aspects of language, it would fail us because we, you know, we couldn't always communicate those subtleties. And that, that in and of itself was really interesting. Does anyone have any questions? you start your travel oh thank you oh that's right um so once you're awarded a grant a fulbright after the one year application process how fast do they move as far as you starting the research and traveling what kind of prep time do you have well <laughs> you are really the person who's doing that so when you write the grant your timeline for that is sort of built into the grant. And then uh, the way they di disperse the money is like it's a grant in installments. And, um, you know, things were handled in some, you know, the money that was paid for your living expenses was just automatically deposited into my checking account. The flight arrangements I had to make through them 
Uh, they also gave us extra money that we could spend when we were there to buy supplies for our host institution. If you're taking dependents with you, that's a whole other different pot of money. So when you apply, it's like I applied to go over and start at the end of September. So I found out in May, and then I basically spent all those months in between finalizing my plan. So you'll know what date, you, when you go over is a date that you negotiate with your host institution. You know, you could you could write an application and turn it in in August and not go until February of the year, you know, in a year and a half. It just depends. Um, you, a lot of universities in other parts of the world do not have the same academic cycle that we have. It's one of the reasons why I chose not to extend my grant for six months because it would have brought me back halfway in the spring semester. Um, Plus, I had been gone really a long time too. So, uh, and I'm and I'm sure that some of the ways that they're doing things are are different now. When I became a senior specialist, they wouldn't pay for you to use a service to get your visa. But the only place I could get a visa to Kazakhstan at that time was in D.C. And so I said to them, "Well, do you want to pay for me to go to D.C. or do you want to pay for me to use a visa service?" And they paid for the visa service for me, but. You're going to end up doing a lot of the legwork. Nobody's going to be making a lot of arrangements for you. I mean, Fulbright arranged to have somebody from the embassy pick me up when I got to Zagreb and take my suitcases up to uh, my apartment. And that was pretty much it. Everything else from that point on, I had to figure out. Now, they had briefings for us and stuff, things like security briefings, they had us come out to Washington, D.C. for a three-day orientation. But you could be 100% prepared, and it would not prepare you. Because it's just not that kind of – I don't know what it was like for you, Lewis. But. So nobody's looking over your shoulder to make sure you're doing your research. The reason this works is because they look at those proposals and they get people that really want to do what they say they want to do, and it works. Um, boy, it, it, you know, I mean, things happen like we got stuck in a bus station <laughs> and we ended up just staying in a hotel and our hosts from the village went looking around for us. They stopped at every hotel in town till they found us. Uh, we couldn't get through on the phone. It was it was very difficult. And you asked when we found out. I did not find out about my first grant. They called me on September 27th and asked if I could leave November 1st. And I said, how about November 15th? And they said, well, we'll get back to you. And they called back the next day and I, they said, well, the 15th will work, but the 16th won't. I said, great. And the second one I found out in the middle of the summer to leave in, I think it was October. Um, so it depends. And uh, if that happened now, I would probably would have had to turn it down. The other opportunity that I was told myself I was going to mention is that I wrote a Fulbright grant to bring somebody from Thailand here to teach a class, and they paid for everything. So this woman, she was from a third world pottery village. And for a semester, she received an assistant professor salary paid for by the Fulbright and plane flight and some other small things. They seem small here that amounted to a bunch of money over there. We got something very novel for a semester. She taught a mural carving class here, and my students made these big, large ceramic murals. And we could have never done that as well by ourselves. Uh, so it's worth looking at that at that site with a really open mind. And what is it I want them to pay for? You know, I love free money. Um, and how much support you get probably I could have gotten more support from the, both the embassy and the Fulbright had I asked for it, but they were eight hours away and I couldn't call them on the phone very easily. Um, 
And so I didn't get that much support. I think my experience was a little bit more. That, a follow-up question to that would be, um, have you worked it out to do a sabbatical with a Fulbright? And do you just have a second contingency plan in case you don't get that Fulbright? Is that how that works for you? They didn't have sabbaticals when I got my Fulbright. And so at the time, Sandra Harper was the provost and um, she negotiated with me to put me at halftime when I was over there. But I think now the mechanism would be developmental leave. You know, it just didn't exist when I got mine. And some of the countries will pay, you know, the Fulbright grant money isn't, it isn't a ton of money. Um, because you're going and you're teaching at whatever salaries in the country that you're going to. But some of the countries will offer you a small stipend. And I didn't even know I was getting one until I got over there. And as was typical when I was on the Fulbright, you know, if I was dealing with students and faculty, you know, the language was never an issue. But if you had to actually get into the Croatian bureaucracy, it was like a labyrinth. And so to get this stipend, I had to take a tram to the far outskirts of the city to only one bank that was only open for certain hours where no one spoke English. <laughs> and they would just count this cash out. And I never knew how much I was going to get because I couldn't read any of the things that it was. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I just did it. You know, you just you just kind of have to do it. And so there's a lot of that. I mean, it's not like this, you know, well-oiled, smooth, uh, <laughs> problemless thing. You have to be somebody who can go with the flow. And, I, you know, I took buses many times outside of the city. And Croatian's a hard language. And I would just get on the bus and I'd say, Rijeka? <laughs> And people would go, no, and you get off the bus and get on the next one because you couldn't tell. <laughs> I'm actually not kidding about that. But, you know, if you could say hello, thank you, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sorry I don't speak Croatian, uh, that got you really far, Uh just these tiny, tiny little uh, efforts at politeness. Uh, I think my experience in, in Germany was a little bit more structured uh, in the sense that that I was able to, uh, when, when I was asked to, I was asked to come in May. I'm sorry, I was, I was told I was allowed to come in May and, and I arrived in August and there was an orientation meeting in August so I had some kind of, of, of heads up uh, for doing it. And so there, there was, I, I didn't have as much of the experience of, um, of being lost, right? We did have an orientation meeting uh, that, that did give me some help. And I agree with Pam, as long as you make an attempt to try to speak the language, people are really willing to help you. Uh, so I, I think there's different experiences in different countries. Uh, and I think uh, it, it may not be as as um, challenging in every country uh, to travel. Uh, and I think I was fortunate, especially hearing Lewis's uh, story about being bitten by a rat. I never had that experience. Uh, so I think different countries have different experiences. But uh, I think I think in, at least in the case of Germany, it was a little bit more structured in terms of an orientation starting point and an end point. It was really it was really helpful to have this little card that they gave me that said I was a researcher. I had research clearance from the Thai government. I could pull out all of these things, my passport, my research clearance, this card from the the embassy and everything else. If somebody stopped me, I'd just pass them all these pieces of paper and it would open doors and it would get the uh uh police who are looking for graft off my neck, you know. And yeah, the, the official status, the official status of being a researcher from a foreign government was really helpful. I got to talk to people in museums, everybody, you know, it was great. 
I, I had been working for six and a quarter an hour mixing clay, and all of a sudden, I I saw it as a lot of money. It was certainly plenty for me. I bought a car when I was in Thailand. Uh, if I wanted to eat in a restaurant, I could eat in a restaurant. It was a new experience for me. Uh, but it would not be a lot of money now. It was certainly enough to do what I needed to do. And those relationships... I just made re reconnected with the two. I, I worked at a big commercial pottery, and there were two women that worked there for a dollar a day is what they got as their wage. And they did our laundry and helped us and some other things. They didn't do much of our laundry. They cooked. She had a cook. I had these ties out in the village cooking for me, you know, sometimes. Uh, and I just reconnected with them, and it was so nice to be able to talk to them again. I never could talk to them when I was there. My tie was a good market tie, and now I can speak, and it's it's just it's wonderful. There was an amazing market about five minutes from my house, and my landlord only cooked dinner for me, so I was responsible for breakfast mm -hmm. and lunch. And um, everything was in kilos, right? And so I finally learned enough Croatian to ask for something. And I had to learn the word for half kilo, polo, polo kilo. And um, the first thing I bought was dried figs. And I was so excited that I could su successfully negotiate this exchange at the market. But I went back the next day and bought them again. And it's like I had this <laughs> So... We would go, Gail went with me, my wife went with me, and we would go to the market and buy chicken and vegetables. And Gail went, we always bought our chicken from the same woman. We bought things, we were loyal customers because they already knew how to deal with us. And the chicken lady, I, don't, I really, I don't know her name. She's the chicken lady. And we went there every day. And one day the chicken lady said to Gail, what do you do with all the chicken? Gail says, I cook it. And she said, you can cook? Gail said, yeah, I can cook. And the cook said, the chicken lady said, don't you have a cook to cook for you? And she said, no, I do the cooking myself. But you're an American. You're rich. You can have a helper. You know? Gail said, no, we really rather do it ourselves. And You know, what people expect of us was in Thailand. I mean, it's still that way. You know, I get, I get, it drives me crazy sometimes, but it's really interesting to see how people perceive us. And you'll learn, if you go someplace, you'll learn more about yourself than you will about them. At least it'll be more profound. I also think it'd be much easier today now that the internet is so established. When I went over there, it was still pretty rough and cell phones weren't as uh, accessible as they are now. But I'll tell you one tradition I wish we would import. At the beginning of the semester at the university, the provost and all the higher admin would pay for this massive party and they would take this <laughs> long hallway and they would cover it with tables from end to end. And it was covered with food and alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of toasting. They had, a, they had a lovely tradition that if it was like a holiday or a birthday or somebody was getting married, that person put on the party. So, you know, but the beginning of the semester with the big food and drinkathon was pretty, and it was in the middle of the afternoon, and you could just take a cab home, right? So that was very nice. <laughs> Any other questions? We love talking about them. Yeah.
Maybe technology has gone too far. <laughs> Okay, I've got some things to say. I've seen some things trip up about leaves. It is really important if you're applying for a Fulbright that you immediately tell your chair and your dean that you're doing it, what semester it is, and that you keep them up to date. When things get close, there's no time to waste because they have to make arrangements for you to be gone. And if you wait, it will create incredible problems for people. On the other side of it, when I got my second Fulbright, which I couldn't take in 1994, the university had no way to deal with it. They said, well, you can leave, but we aren't going to pay you. It won't count towards tenure and promotion. Uh, and all of that has changed. And the university now wants you to have a Fulbright. So people will try and make it work, even if it happens late, I think. What? I would do if I were applying for one now, Andrew would be, I would apply for developmental leave for the time period that I was expecting to apply for the Fulbright. And I think if you didn't get the Fulbright, the university would probably let you cancel your developmental leave because, you know, that is the mechanism for allowing people to do it. And then, you know, if you apply for a year long or even just a semester, you can choose your pay option and still get paid by Fulbright. Is if you read the policy, that's what it says. All right, everyone. Well, I think we are out of time. Thank you again to all of our in person and online attendees, as well as our panelists. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Did we